Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 171 of the GDPR Weekly Show. And we begin this week with news that Telecom and Satellite TV provider Sky has taken almost 18 months to fix security flaws in its routers in the UK. We then have news of a data breach at adult entertainment provider DripChat. And we then have news of a data breach at the UK Department for Education. We then travel to Dorset in the UK where there's news of a data breach at Dorset Council. And we then travel to South Yorkshire where an ex-police officer has received compensation from South Yorkshire Police after a data breach. We then travel to the USA and in particular to Massachusetts where Drizzy Grove has reached settlements after a data breach. And we then return to the UK where a high court judge has claimed abuse of the legal system to bring a minor data breach claim to the high court. We then travel to Belgium where the Belgian Supreme Court has ruled that data protection authorities may impose fines even when complainants' data has not been processed. We then have news that US and UK security agencies are warning that Iranian-backed hackers are targeting critical sectors of the economy. We then travel to the USA where the FBI's email server has been hacked to send fake cyber attack alerts. Remaining in the USA, we travel to Washington DC where there's been an attempted data breach at Love County Board of Elections. We then return to the UK where Credit Suisse is to impose sanctions on Allen and Overy over data breach concerns. And we then return to the USA where Utah Medical Center has had a data breach. And remaining in the USA, we have news of ongoing litigation against Colonial Pipeline following their data breach earlier this year. We then travel to California, where the California Pizza Kitchen has had a data breach. And then continuing to our look at data protection legislation worldwide, we look at the Cayman Islands implementation of GDPR. And then finally this week, we travel to Singapore, where Red Doors has been fined by the Singapore Data Protection Commission following a data breach. So as always, a wide range of articles for you this week. We hope that you find the information in the articles useful and informative. As always, if you've got any feedback for us, please do email us at feedback at gprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive, and wherever possible, we incorporate your suggestions for improvements into the show. Unfortunately, due to the volume of feedback we receive, it's not always possible for us to respond to each piece of feedback individually. We are extremely pleased to announce the launch of our first book called GDPR Made Simple. It's available right now on Amazon. So if you just go to Amazon and search for GDPR Made Simple, you will find our book. Alternatively, go to gdprmadesimple.club and you can click through from our new website there directly to the page to buy the book on Amazon. For a limited period until the end of November, it's only £7.99 which is a saving of £7 on the normal price. As its name suggests, we've made it a very simple guide to GDPR, but nonetheless a guide which covers everything that you need to do to ensure that your organisation is UK GDPR compliant. And so we'd be extremely grateful if you'd purchase a copy of our new book. Profits from the book help to go towards the cost of running the GDPR weekly show. And of course, if you've got any feedback on the book, then please either leave the feedback on Amazon or alternatively, uh, email us, as usual, at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We really hope you like the book. We've put many hours into its production. And we hope, like the podcast, you find it extremely useful. <laughs> we begin this week with news that Sky has been very slow in fixing a security bug in its routers. It's understood that the entertainment company Sky took more than 17 months to fix the security flaw that impacted roughly 6 million routers across the UK. The DNS rebinding vulnerability was discovered in May 2020 by Raf Finney, a researcher at British cybersecurity company Pentest Partners. Six router models were affected by the flaw, the Sky Hub 3, Sky Hub 3.5, Booster 3, Sky Hub, Sky Hub 4 and Booster 4. In a blog post, Pentest Partners said it affected users with the default router's admin password, admin colon sky, which was the case for a high percentage of routers. The flaw could have exposed the victim's home network to the internet, allowing a cyber criminal to gain direct access to the victim's computers and devices. Pentest Partners have criticised Sky's snail-paced approach to fixing the problem, 
Sky did not prioritise fixing the issue, taking nearly 18 months to fully resolve it, failing to meet numerous deadlines they set themselves. They added, despite having a published vulnerability disclosure programme, Sky's communications were particularly poor and had to be chased multiple times for responses. Pentest partners grew so frustrated with this Sky's apparent lack of action, they eventually reached out to the BBC on August the 6th this year over the matter. Only after we had involved a trusted journalist was the remediation programme accelerated, Pentest partners said. In an email on October 22nd, Sky said that 99% of the affected routers had now been updated. The company has offered to replace affected routers free of charge for its customers. After being alerted to the risk, we began work on finding a remedy for the problem and we can confirm that a fix has been delivered to all Sky manufactured products, said Sky. If we receive any further update on this from Sky or from pen testers, we will of course bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. Strip Chat, which is one of the internet's top five adult cam sites, suffered a data breach earlier this month. The data breach caused the data of millions of users and models to be exposed. The problem was with the website's Elasticsearch database cluster online, which was online without a password for over three days. Within that time, from November 4th to the 7th, millions of users and CAM models information was exposed. The information of more than 65 million users included usernames, email, IP addresses, tip balance and last login date. For the models, at least 421,000 models information, including their prices, username and gender, were also exposed. Information on 134 million transactions occurring during the period were also exposed. However, no information was leaked regarding payment details. Finally, information on at least 719,000 chat messages. No content of private messages was revealed, though. We have contacted StripChat for a comment, but at the time of going to broadcast, they've not come back to us. However, the site did issue a statement to its users on their website on Friday, saying we are confident that passwords, payment details and account verification documents were not accessed. We've not established whether StripChat have reported this to the ICO or not, but we will continue our investigation and hopefully bring you an update in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. The Department for Education has apologised after a group of Academy finance staff's details were compromised in a data breach. More than 850 staff working in trust finance had signed up for a virtual event next week where the Department for Education will advise attendees on funding levels, the pupil premium, the national funding formula and other topics. Education and Skills Funding Agency Interim CEO John Edwards is due to speak at the event. But attendees received an email on Thursday revealing officials had discovered the calendar invitation enables people to see the email addresses of other participants. The invite was immediately cancelled and officials asked guests to remove the meeting from calendars. The email also revealed one instance saw an attendee add the invite to their calendar only to trigger a new meeting invitation to everyone else. At this stage, we do not know what has allowed this to happen, but we've logged this formally as a data breach and would like to sincerely apologise to everyone for the confusion and inconvenience this has caused, the Department for Education told attendees. Organisers confirmed that the event will still go ahead as planned. A spokesperson for the Information Commissioner's Office said on Friday morning it had not received a breach report from the Department for Education, but not all breaches had to be reported. Organisations must notify the ICO within 72 hours of becoming aware of a personal data breach unless it does not pose a risk to people's rights and freedoms, the spokesman said. A government survey published earlier this year found that 36% of primary schools and 58% of secondary schools had identified breaches or attacks in the past year. The Department of Education's 2019-2020 to annual report said progress had been made on cybersecurity with an ongoing coordinated programme of work to strengthen controls. It recorded three protected personal data-related incidents at the department in the year which it reported to the ICO, which was up from two in the two previous years. We've contacted the Department of Education for a comment, but at the time of broadcast, we've not heard back from them. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. To Dorset now, and a potential data breach at Dorset Council has been reported to the ICO for investigation. Dorset councillors have been told that the suspected breach, first noticed in September, is not thought to be a major issue and has been flagged as amber in the council's traffic light risk grading, otherwise known as a RAG analysis, red, amber, green. It is limited to just one council department. Councillors have been told that at the moment there is no further information available to them, but the matter is now due to be discussed with the chair of the council's audit and governance committee. Cranbourne and Alderholt councillor, councillor David Took, said... 
It could be technical or trivial, or it could be very serious. We need to know which end of the stick we are holding. He has also called for information on why there were 11 data breaches investigated last year, but so far this year the council was looking at three. Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee Chairman, Councillor Shane Bartlett, told councillors that breaches can result in censure if the council has not responded properly and taken appropriate action in the light of the breach. It can bring huge fines if we haven't responded properly, he said. If we hear any further update from this from Dorset Council, we will of course bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com To South Yorkshire now, and a former police officer who was sacked over a criminal offence has sued South Yorkshire Police for a data breach which the force has blamed on human error. The lady concerned was with South Yorkshire Police for six years following her relocation to Sheffield to be closer to her immediate family before she was dismissed due to a drink driving charge. The former police officer, who had served 21 years in the Metropolitan Police prior to moving to South Yorkshire, found out her data was breached after an ex-colleague and friend got in touch with her to say they'd been contacted by a third party about her case. South Yorkshire Police paperwork had been sent to the home of another former police officer by mistake. Her disciplinary file and its outcome, as well as her name, address and barring status, had all been accessed by a third party. She sought legal action through Liverpool-based High Street solicitors and received £1,750 in compensation for the data breach, which she said had caused a great stress. She said, This data breach has caused us a great amount of stress for me and my family. I was unable to speak to my family and closest friends about the dismissal as it was so upsetting, and to think a third party had access to the disciplinary hearing and result is deeply disturbing. The information disclosed is incredibly sensitive, and I have felt highly embarrassed, stressed and anxious about this data breach. I can only thank High Street Solicitors for taking legal action, which will hopefully ensure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Naomi Jones, head of data breach at High Street Solicitors, said, No one's personal sensitive information should be shared without their consent. This is a very private matter and a claim that has suffered an immense amount of distress as a result of the data breach. I'd urge anyone who believes their personal data has been shared without their consent to contact us. We will work to recover compensation for all data breaches. For their part, South Yorkshire Police said this was a result of human error and they had unreservedly apologised to the victim. The force also said it has taken internal action to help prevent the same mistake happening again in the future. A South Yorkshire Police spokesperson said, Data breaches are something we take incredibly seriously at South Yorkshire Police. In this particular matter, a document containing some personal and sensitive information relating to the complainant was posted to another former police officer as a result of human error. We have unreservedly apologised to the victim and understand the upset and distress this matter has caused, which in turn has been reflected in a settlement agreement with the individual. We have also taken steps internally to help avoid the same error from happening again in the future. We are extremely pleased to announce the launch of our first book called GDPR Made Simple. It's available right now on Amazon, so if you just go to Amazon and search for GDPR Made Simple, you will find our book. Alternatively, go to gdprmadesimple.club and you can click through from our new website there directly to the page to buy the book on Amazon. For a limited period until the end of November, it's only £7.99, which is a saving of £7 on the normal price. As its name suggests, we've made it a very simple guide to GDPR, but nonetheless a guide which covers everything that you need to do to ensure that your organisation is UK GDPR compliant. And so we'd be extremely grateful if you'd purchase a copy of our new book. Profits from the book help to go towards the cost of running the GDPR Weekly Show. And of course, if you've got any feedback on the book, then please either leave the feedback on Amazon or alternatively email us as usual, at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We really hope you like the book. We've put many hours into its production, and we hope, like the podcast, you find it extremely useful. (laughs) To Massachusetts now in the US, and on November the 4th, the US District Court for the District of Massachusetts granted final approval to a settlement in a class action against an alcohol e-commerce platform stemming from a data breach that allegedly compromised customers' personally identifiable information. The e-commerce platform, which was operated by the Drizzly Group Memorandum of Law, requested approval for the class action settlement, which included a settlement class of 2.5 million individuals whose information was compromised. Class members claimed that the company did not publicly report the data breach until July 2020 and that customers' information was available for purchase on the dark web. A complaint was filed against the defendant asserting claims of negligence, negligence per se, breach of implied contract, 
unjust enrichment and violations of several state consumer protection statutes. The defendant moved to compel arbitration, citing a provision in its terms of service as well as a class action waiver that required customers to arbitrate their claims individually. However, the parties entered into settlement discussions and agreed to mediate their dispute. Under the terms of the settlement, which is valued at between 3.35 million and 7.1 million US dollars, the defendant has agreed to pay all associated administration costs, attorneys' fees and expenses, and incentive awards. Class members will receive individual cash payments and will also receive a pro rata portion of the pool of up to 447,750 US dollars in the form of a credit against the cost of service fees for future orders on the defendant's platform. The defendant will also implement certain data security measures over the next two years. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse Thursday, 4 p.m. UK time. Master Thornet at the High Court in London has labelled a form of procedural abuse a bid to bring a data breach claim in the High Court where the very modest damages would be dwarfed by costs of £50,000. Master Thornet ordered that Emma Louise Johnson's claim be transferred to the Small Claims Court, having narrowly decided against simply striking it out. Emma Johnson had sued Eastlight Community Homes, a provider of low-cost social housing, after her name, email address and recent rent payments were accidentally disclosed to another tenant. Her details appeared on three pages of a document that was nearly 7,000 pages long and the breach was remedied in less than three hours. The defendant told Ms Johnson about the error and that the recipient had deleted the information. He reported the breach to the ICO, even though it did not think this was necessary and the commissioner did not take any action. Ms Johnson nonetheless instructed solicitors Pure Legal, which has been the leading firm for data breach litigation until it recently went into administration, its president said it had so far incurred £15,000 in costs and gave a total figure of just over £50,000. The defendant applied to strike out the claim or for summary judgment on the basis that either the claimant had suffered no loss or damage above the de minimis threshold or even if they were more, the game is not worth the candle and so still ought to be struck out under the Jamil principle. Master Thornet observed that the disclosed information plainly was not of an obviously sensitive nature in itself. However, Ms Johnson said she had moved to her home three years earlier to escape an abusive relationship and had avoided making her new address public. While she acknowledged that the chances of her former partner receiving information were extremely low, she said the thought of it had left her stressed, worried and very anxious. At the same time, she did not make a personal injury claim, the master noted. Further, her ex-partner could have located her simply utilising publicly available channels as she was not ex-directory and she took no steps to apply to withhold her address from the claim itself. I agree with the defendant's admission that the claimant's distress seems more in the realms of the unknown or the hypothetical than in reality, he said. I also treat it as historic rather than current. Master Thornet said the request for an injunction and a declaration alongside damages was merely an attempt to add credibility to the claim and to convey a greater impression of its importance. It was in reality a claim for at best modest damages. The claimant said no more than £3,000. The master continued, No seriously privately paying litigant would contemplate spending over £50,000 in costs, not all of which may prove recoverable even in the event of success, and similarly expose themselves to the risk of a significant adverse costs or the foreign high court litigation, if unsuccessful, for a damages claim of less than £3,000. The presentation and processing of this case to date in this forum has, I am satisfied, constituted a form of procedural abuse. However, by a very narrow margin, he decided that the question of whether the claimant's entitlement was to purely nominal or extremely low damages should be transferred to the small claims court. Mindful that the court should strive to provide a remedy to any litigant if it can, the claim ought not to be entirely struck out but instead redirected to the more appropriate forum. Everything about this case has all the hallmarks of a small claim track claim that should have been issued in the county court and so allocated. The suggestion that this is a developing area of law or where even if principle is established requires elaborate and complex legal argument is unrealistic if not at least arguably opportunistic. We think this is a really important ruling and it follows on other high court rulings which have seen people awarded damages of just £100 for a data breach. Whilst of course if people suffer real damage as a result of a data breach they should be adequately compensated. It really does raise the question of why any of these cases, where it is relatively small amounts of money and just a single individual concerned, should ever make it to the higher parts of the UK legal system. And we hope that this case may serve as a precedent, which will mean that further cases will not get as far as the high court. 
to Belgium now, and the Belgian Supreme Court ruled in a judgment of October the 7th, 2021, that a data subject has the right to lodge a complaint with the Data Protection Authority against a processing practice that violates the GDPR, in this case the Data Minimisation Principle in Article 6 of GDPR, even where the data subject's personal data was not processed. In this particular case, the company required customers to have their electronic identity cards read by the company's computer system in order to obtain a loyalty card and enjoy discounts on purchases. It was not possible for customers to provide their personal data by alternative means, for example by providing strictly necessary personal data only in paper form. A customer of the company filed a complaint against this processing practice with the Belgian Data Protection Authority. That customer had refused to provide the company with its identity card and refused to consent to the processing and therefore had been denied a loyalty card. The complaint was investigated and the Data Protection Authority found that the practice did in fact give rise to a breach of the data minimisation principle, the principle that posting of personal data must be limited to what is necessary to achieve the relevant purposes. Previously, the Belgian Appellate Court had found that no actual breach had been demonstrated. The court's reasoning was based on the fact that the customer had not provided his electronic identity card and therefore there had been no processing of his personal data. The Belgian Supreme Court did not follow the Appellate Court's reasoning. The Belgian Supreme Court stressed that the breach of GDPR also arises when a controller requires data subjects to have their personal data processed in an uncompliant manner in order to enjoy a benefit or service. When the Data Protection Authority determines that a practice gives rise to a breach, it may take corrective measures and, where appropriate, impose an administrative fine, even if personal data of the complainant was not actually processed. So an interesting ruling there from the Belgian Supreme Court which may well have ramifications right across Europe and, of course, here in the UK too. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. US, UK and Australian cyber authorities have warned that Iran-backed hackers are behind an ongoing ransomware campaign targeting critical infrastructure. Iranian state-sponsored APT groups exploited four Fortinet and Microsoft Exchange floors in order to carry out ransomware attacks, according to the FBI, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre and the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. In a joint statement, the agency said that the FBI and CISA had observed this Iranian government-sponsored APT group exploit Fortinet vulnerabilities since at least March 2021 and the Microsoft Exchange proxy cell vulnerability since at least October 2021. Meanwhile, the ACSC found that the same APT group had exploited the same Microsoft Exchange vulnerability in Australia. The flaws were used to gain access to the systems of critical infrastructure organisations, including those in the US transportation and healthcare sectors, in order to then exfiltrate or encrypt data for extortion. However, the FBI, CISA, ACSE and NCSE stated that the Iranian backed threat actors are focused on exploiting known vulnerabilities rather than targeting specific sectors. The cyber authorities have urged critical infrastructure organisations to patch and update their systems, implement network segmentation and multi-factor authentication, use strong passwords and antivirus software, and to stay alert to any phishing attacks. The guidance follows a separate report from the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Centre, which found that Iranian state-backed hackers stole credentials by sending interview requests to target individuals through emails that contain tracking links to confirm whether the user had opened the file. If a victim responded, they were then sent the link to a fake Google meeting, which led to the credential harvesting page. Microsoft managed to identify six cyber espionage groups in Iran that were found to be behind a spate of ransomware attacks occurring roughly every six weeks since September 2020. Microsoft researchers said that Iranian state-backed hackers collected credentials from over 900 Fortinet VPN servers in the US, Europe and Israel, then shifted to scanning for unpatched on-premises exchange servers vulnerabilities in proxy shell. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. The FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, confirmed on Saturday that a hacker had exploited its systems to send fake emails to law enforcement partners alerting them to a supposed cyber attack. The hacker exploited a misconfiguration in the FBI's Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal, the LWP, web app to send legitimate-looking alerts to partners warning them that they'd suffered a cyber attack and that a threat actor was currently in their system. Emails were sent to partners from an official FBI email account with an at ic.fbi.gov domain, the headers of which also appeared to be legitimate after being sanitised. The hacker falsely informed recipients that they had fallen victim to a sophisticated chain attack attributed to Vinny Troller, a reputable security researcher. Troller rejected his involvement in the attack shortly after its discovery. 
The FBI confirmed that the threat actor was unable to access or compromise any sensitive data held by the FBI and said the server used to send the false emails was used only to push notifications for leap rather than being connected to the FBI's corporate email service. The FBI is aware of a software misconfiguration that temporarily allowed an actor to leverage the law enforcement enterprise portal, Leap, to send fake emails, the FBI said on Saturday. Leap is FBI IT infrastructure used to communicate with our state and local law enforcement partners. While a legitimate email originated from an FBI-operated server, that server was dedicated to pushing notifications for Leap and was not part of the FBI's corporate email service. No actor was able to access or compromise any data or personally identifiable information on the FBI's network. Once we learned of the incident, we quickly remediated the software vulnerability, warned partners to disregard the fake emails, and confirmed the integrity of our network. Researchers at Spam House drew attention to the early reports of fake emails on Saturday, saying the recipients were chosen indiscriminately and email addresses were scraped from an ARIN database. ARIN is a regional internet registry responsible for the management and distribution of internet number resources such as internet protocol, IP addresses and autonomous system numbers, ASNs. Spamhouse said that its telemetry indicated two waves of spam emails being sent, one just before 5 o'clock on Saturday and then another shortly after 7. Security researchers reported having contacted the FBI at the time of the incident said the staff were slammed with calls from alarmed recipients trying to verify if the correspondence was legitimate or not. A hacker known by the alias Pom Pom Purin claimed responsibility for the attack in an interview with security researcher Brian Krebs. They said they wanted to draw attention to security vulnerability in the Leap web application. Pom Pom Purin said Leap allowed anyone to apply for an account despite it being reserved only for law enforcement partners of the FBI. Account authentication was also run through a one-time passcode email to the applicant, a code which the FBI's website leaked in the HTML code of its web page. When users requested a confirmation code, they were sent a post request which included parameters for the email subject and body content. Pom Pom Purin replaced the parameters with his own email subject and body to automate thousands of email sends. Experts have suggested that the level of access Pom Pom Purin was able to achieve was worrying and that a wider attack campaign could have been launched to compromise law enforcement partners right across the USA. We are extremely pleased to announce the launch of our first book called GDPR Made Simple. It's available right now on Amazon, so if you just go to Amazon and search for GDPR Made Simple, you will find our book. Alternatively, go to gdprmadesimple.club and you can click through from our new website there directly to the page to buy the book on Amazon. For a limited period until the end of November, it's only £7.99, which is a saving of £7 on the normal price. As its name suggests, we've made it a very simple guide to GDPR, but nonetheless a guide which covers everything that you need to do to ensure that your organisation is UK GDPR compliant. And so we'd be extremely grateful if you'd purchase a copy of our new book. Profits from the book help to go towards the cost of running the GDPR weekly show. And of course, if you've got any feedback on the book, then please either leave the feedback on Amazon or alternatively email us as usual at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We really hope you like the book. We've put many hours into its production and we hope, like the podcast, you find it extremely useful. To Washington DC now and late county auditor Christopher Galloway's phone began going wild in August when screenshots of information taken from Lake County's computer system ended up on display at a cyber symposium that my pillow founder Mike Lindell said would demonstrate election fraud. We were shocked that sleepy little Lake County, where nobody had ever made a suggestion of election misconduct, was suddenly being splashed around a cyber symposium, said Galloway who immediately began working with the Lake County Board of Elections and the Ohio Secretary of State's office to figure out what had happened. The cyber symposium did not show election fraud, and the Lake County information displayed by conspiracy theorists had nothing to do with the county's elections, which run on a separate computer system from the rest of the county. Galloway says someone in the Lake County Commissioner's office plugged an unknown county laptop into an Ethernet port from 4pm to 9pm on the day of Ohio's May the 4th primaries, and recorded the equivalent of computers and printers talking to each other at a time when nobody was there. Whoever did it used a scanning program to manually pull in packets of data. They just got a lot of nothing, Galloway said. It was some copier talking to a desktop saying, I'm still here waiting for you to send me a print job. 
The breach has triggered a federal and state probe first reported on Friday by the Washington Post, which revealed that public records requests showed that John Hammercheck, a Lake County Commissioner and retired police officer, used his security badge to swipe into the fifth floor offices several times during the time when the leaked data showed the laptop was intimately connected to the county network. The Post report said the Lake County episode bore striking similarities to an incident in Colorado earlier this year when government officials helped an outsider gain access to the county voting system in an effort to find fraud. Both incidents point to an escalation in attacks on the nation's voting systems by those who have embraced Trump's false claims that the 2020 election was riddled with fraud, that include targeting local officials in a bid to gain access to election systems, moves that themselves could undermine election security. The Ohio Secretary of State's office confirmed it had investigated the matter and referred its findings to the FBI and the Ohio Attorney General's office. The Secretary of State's office also said the Attorney General's office had confirmed it had opened an investigation. Lake County Election Board Director R. Ross MacDonald said the county's board of election data was fully segmented from the county's networks and there was no way someone could breach the election system. Cybersecurity has taken a stronghold in Ohio's board of elections, said MacDonald, who assisted with the Secretary of State's investigation. We did two-factor authentication on all machines. Galloway and MacDonald said they did not know who went into the county system, how they transmitted it to Lindell's group, or what their intentions were. Galloway said he's handed all the information he has over to the FBI. The good news about this was that the breach showed that our network security was really strong, said Galloway. They didn't get anything. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. Returning to the UK now, and major Allen and Overy client Credit Suisse is to limit work it provides to the firm in the future after it raised concerns about potential client conflicts and data breaches within the firm. Two people with knowledge of the situation said that the bank has raised concerns over potential data breaches within major Allen and Overy. The people added that the bank's general counsel, Romeo Ceruti, has also been particularly unhappy over ANO's advisor role to failed financier Greensill Capital. ANO advised the financer on its funding for an attempted initial public offering and its restructuring process. The Swiss banking giant is currently facing investor claims attempting to win back losses from investments linked to Grinsil. One person with knowledge of the situation said that ANO was subject to a data breach earlier this year, raising concerns from credit squeezes in the house team. Is that terms regarding either a lessening of work or a blacklisting are yet to be put in place by Dreddit Suisse, one person at the firm said, describing messaging from the bank as unclear. While active matters will not be affected, the decision is likely to impact future work, one person with knowledge of the situation said. The bank is a major client for the firm, with one person with knowledge of the situation estimating it accounts for between £25 and £30 million pounds of the firm's revenue every year. An ANO spokesperson said, we do not comment on client matters. A spokesperson for Credit Suisse similarly declined to comment. ANO's place on the Swiss banking giant's global legal panel was renewed at the start of this year, having first been appointed in 2018. Mandates it has advised the bank on in the UK in recent years include the provision of a new $400 million revolving credit facility for airline EasyJet. Data breaches and cyber attacks have affected various law firms in the last year. In August, the German arm of international law firm CMS was hit by a cyber attack. In February, both Goodwin and Jones Day were impacted by an attack after a third-party vendor, Acelion, was targeted by a hacking group called CELOP. In 2017, Yellow Piper was hit by a major cyber attack, which hit its phones and computers across the UK, Europe, the US and the Middle East. Returning to America now and Utah Imaging Associates, a Utah-based radiology centre has announced a data breach affecting 582,170 people after their personal information was exposed. According to the data breach notification sent to affected individuals, the security incident was discovered on September the 4th this year and was remediated on the same day. However, the initial network infiltration happened on August the 29th this year, allowing the threat out of the internal systems and potentially still data for about a week. The subsequent forensic investigation carried out with the help of a specialised third-party cybersecurity firm revealed that the unauthorised network intruder had access to the following personal information of patients. Their first and last name, their mailing address, their date of birth, their social security number, their health insurance policy number, and medical information about them, which might have included medical treatments, diagnosis, and prescription information. The type of information varies by individuals, and not all individuals would have had all of these categories of data stolen. UIA also points out they've received no reports of data having been leaked online two months after the incident. 
This, however, doesn't guarantee that any stolen data hasn't been privately shared amongst hackers on the dark web, as is commonly in the case with data breaches. People who used UIA services in the past should take advantage of the offer 12 months of credit monitoring services through IDX and remain vigilant against social engineering attacks. If you've noticed signs of fraud, unusual bank account charges or suspicious emails or calls, you are advised to report it immediately by calling 833-525-2720. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you're a regular listener to the GDPR Weekly Show, then you might remember that back in episodes 158, 148 and 147, we brought you news of the massive data breach at Colonial Oil Pipeline in the US. Uh, this week, there were news of some class actions which are ongoing against Colonial. Dickerson purports to represent a class of consumers who contend that they paid higher prices at the pump as a result of the shutdown. And Easy Mart, in turn, purports to represent a class of gas stations that claim to have suffered fuel shortages or paid excessively high prices for gas. These consumers and gas stations are located on the East Coast because the Colonial Pipeline supplies nearly half of the East Coast's fuel supply. In both Dickerson and Easy Mart, plaintiffs seek to hold Colonial Pipeline liable because it allegedly failed to implement and maintain reasonable security measures, procedures and practices appropriate to its business. Colonial Pipeline has moved to dismiss the both putative class actions on similar grounds. Colonial Pipeline has also moved to strike the class action allegations in both cases as representing purported fail-safe classes, arguing that ascertaining the classes would require ascertaining liability. Colonial Pipeline moves to dismiss both suits in their entirety as preempted by the federal regulatory scheme for gas pipelines. Colonial Pipeline explains it does not bear duties for customers so far removed from its work decrying the imposition of such a duty to prevent economic ripple effects as being an absurdity. Colonial Pipeline also seeks to bar plaintiffs' claims based on the economic loss rule. Plaintiffs, in turn, argue that their dependence on the pipeline gives rise to an ordinary duty of care. Plaintiffs add that this duty of care is non-contractual and therefore not barred by the economic loss rule. The outcome of these cases, specifically the extent to which downstream duties can be implicated by data breaches, could have a major impact on the future of data privacy or cyber security litigation, and it will be important to keep an eye on any major developments, which of course we will do right here on the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. Remain in America and going to California now, and California Pizza Kitchen served up far more than tasty meals recently after a data breach exposed the names and social security numbers of more than 100,000 current and former employees. The external system breach occurred on September 15th at the popular US pizza chain and affected 103,767 people, according to a data breach notification posted on the website of the Maine Attorney General. California Pizza Kitchen, founded in Beverly Hills in California in 1985, has more than 250 locations across 32 states in the US. California Pizza Kitchen discovered suspicious activity in its computing environment on or about September 15th and took hasty action to mitigate and investigate the occurrence with third-party IT specialists. California Pizza Kitchen immediately secured the environment and launched an investigation to determine the nature and scope of the incident. The company wrote in the notice, California Pizza Kitchen sent to affected residents of Maine. By October 4th, the investigators confirmed that certain files on California Pizza Kitchen's systems could have been accessed without authorization, according to the notice. By the end of the initial review on October the 13th, it was clear that the breach of this delivered attachers the names of former and current employees in combination with their social security numbers. California Pizza Kitchen provided written notice to all affected individuals of the breach on Monday, November the 15th. At this time, there's no indication that the information access has been abused by cyber criminals, the company said. Companies say they're currently reviewing existing security policies and have implemented additional measures including safeguards and employee training to help prevent similar incidents going forward. We are extremely pleased to announce the launch of our first book called GDPR Made Simple. It's available right now on Amazon, so if you just go to Amazon and search for GDPR Made Simple, you will find our book. Alternatively, go to gdprmadesimple.club and you can click through from our new website there directly to the page to buy the book on Amazon. For a limited period until the end of November, it's only £7.99, which is a saving of £7 on the normal price. As its name suggests, we've made it a very simple guide to GDPR, but nonetheless a guide which covers everything that you need to do 
to ensure that your organisation is UK GDPR compliant. And so we'd be extremely grateful if you'd purchase a copy of our new book, Profits from the Book, help to go towards the cost of running the GDPR Weekly Show. And of course, if you've got any feedback on the book, then please either leave the feedback on Amazon or alternatively, email us as usual at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We really hope you like the book. We've put many hours into its production and we hope, like the podcast, you find it extremely useful. (laughs) We've often mentioned on the GDPR Weekly Show countries other than the UK and EU countries which have based their data protection legislation on GDPR. And this week we thought we'd just give a little update on the Cayman Islands because the Cayman Islands have actually been using GDPR since it came in except they've incorporated it into their own Data Protection Act. So they have the same principles of data controllers and data processors and data subjects as we do. But they do have a few little differences. One is that a data breach must be reported to the Ombudsman and to the individuals concerned without undue delay but not later than five days after the breach has been discovered. The Ombudsman expects all data breaches to be reported to the Ombudsman. And in terms of enforcement, a personal data breach may not by itself lead to enforcement action by the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman will examine the circumstances of the breach and will determine whether an investigation needs to be launched. Failing to notify the Ombudsman or the individual of any security incident may cause additional damages to the individual whose data has been breached and result in damage to an entity's business reputation if an enforcement order is subsequently issued. It further gives rise to an offence under the Data Protection Act in the Cayman Islands and can result in a conviction of a fine of $100,000. Depending on the facts of the matter, it may also be the subject of a monetary penalty imposed by the Ombudsman under Section 55 of the Act. Since they came in in 2018, there have been six cases where an enforcement notice has been issued. To Singapore now, and Singapore's Personal Data Protection Commission has issued a fine of 74,000 Singapore dollars, it's 54,450 US dollars, on travel company Comeja, which operates a travel booking website named Red Doors that exposed 5.9 million customers' data the largest data breach handled by the Commission since its inception. The Personal Data Protection Commission announced a penalty for failing to put in place reasonable security arrangements to prevent the unauthorised access and exfiltration of customers' personal data hosted in a cloud database. Red Doors started life in Indonesia before moving its operations to Singapore, from where it aggregates budget hotel bookings in selected Southeast Asian cities. A user selects a budget hotel from Red Doors based on photos, area and price, not always knowing the actual name or location of the hotel. When the traveller arrives, the hotel room experience is rebranded as Red Doors and comes with certain guaranteed services like Wi-Fi, TV and drinkable water. To measure learned there was a data breach of its Red Doors customers back in September 2020 when an Atlanta-based cybersecurity firm notified parent company of the hack and offered remedial services. Within a week, the travel tech company informed the Personal Data Protection Commission. The stolen data included names, contact numbers, email addresses, birthdays, encrypted Red Doors account passwords and booking information. According to the ruling, the database did not include credit card numbers. The data stolen was put up for sale on the hackers forum. The mistake that got the data stolen goes back to the company's startup days when a Amazon Web Services access key was embedded into an Android application package, APK, publicly available for download from the Google Play Store. The APK, created in 2015 and last updated in January 2018, was erroneously marked as test key by developers at the time. It remained visible despite being regarded as defunct until the company was notified of the breach in 2020. With the Amazon Web Services access key in hand, the criminals could gain access and exfiltrate customer records hosted in an Amazon RDS cloud database. Red Doors did make attempts to protect the data, for example, by hiring cybersecurity companies and using Java obfuscation tool ProGuard to prevent APK reverse engineering, but it was all in vain because the relevant file was never evaluated. Red Door's founder and CEO, Amit Sambanwell, said, We immediately conducted internal reviews and subsequently engaged external cybersecurity firms to enhance security measures. At the time, we had also informed all our users, public media and respective authorities of the breach. PDBC in Singapore recently concluded the investigation after over a year and a half 
and deemed the case closed with the 74,000 fine issued. Dremesha told PDPC the failure to implement sufficiently robust processes to manage its inventory of infrastructure access fees was due to high employee turnover. However, the regulating authority did say it considered the company's cooperative behaviour, remedial actions, ineffective yet regular security reviews and the unfortunate circumstances of being a hospitality business in the middle of a pandemic as it decided on the financial penalty. The Commission gave to measure 30 days to pay before interest begin. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurer production. Until next time, bye-bye.